Like when we're unsafe and we don't have those glimmers, we are going to be dictated by other people and we're also going to try to dictate how other people feel. Hurt people hurt people, right? Why do hurt people hurt people? Because they have no other option but to try and transfer your joy and steal it from you. Like your happiness and steal it from you because that's how they're trying to rebalance themselves. Like we're all working for rebalance. Glimmers are trying to show you, you don't need other people to rebalance you. You need other people to fully benefit from the joy-filled life that we were created for. This is the Made for Living Well podcast, hosted by Alexa Sherm, the place to create a life well-lived. Welcome back to this podcast. As always, my name's Alexa, and this is the place where I believe you were made for living well, which means health, happiness, all the things we're really looking for in life are not places that you arrive, but it's a way of life. It's how you create it. And today we're talking all about happiness. I have invited my husband Peyton on for another podcast as we dive into the monthly theme inside the Nourish Planner. Now, I want to tell you about the Nourish Planner. We did find one more box. So if you want to check out the Nourish Planner, you can get it 50% off since the year's half over. There's 15 left, so grab one while they're still there. You can find that at thelivingwell.com. Now, while you're at The Living Well, I have released a blog post that talks more about this subject. It shows you a chart that we're going to talk about more inside the podcast about emotional energy and also just how to live happier. So I'd encourage you to check that out and get signed up for the email list. Now, one thing that helps this podcast more than anything is when you share it with your friends and family to spread the information and the love about changing your perspective of health and combining your mind and body, which is what we're going to talk about all summer long. So make sure you share it with your friends and family and tell them to join us right here on the Made for Living Well podcast. Okay, make sure you check out the website, sign up for the newsletter, and snag a planner as we talk more about the monthly themes all year long. For right now, let's get right to this theme for the month of May, How to Become Happier. Welcome to the podcast, Thanks Peyton. for inviting me back again. <laughs> you have to change up what you say because you know you don't want to say the same thing. I know. It annoys me when I listen to podcasts and they just seem so repetitive and... Yeah. I'm not very creative with it. So it's kind of like on the spot. I'm like, oh shoot, I should have prepared for the intro. What am I going to say? So, But you told me I say the same thing every guest I have on. Yeah. But as the guest, I feel like I should say something different. Okay. You've just been on so many times that now it's like, okay. I know. I feel like now I finally have uh, have surpassed other guests for the single guest that's been on the most. Yeah, you have for sure. Today we're talking about happiness. And the listeners can tell you, stop having them on, please. I know. But you were talking about happiness today. Woohoo! <laughs> so today is May. And inside the Nurse Planner, it's how to become happier. Now, this is a subject that I feel like I had a huge shift in understanding. And that's why I wrote it inside the planner, because I think we have these preconceived ideas about what happiness is. The reality is that's not happiness. And when I started to understand this, I felt like it gave me control over my happiness instead of letting everything else around me control my happiness. And that's a big shift, right? When we stop letting external things be able to dictate how we feel and we choose to start feeling the way that we want to feel. Now, I have to admit that I'm not always the happiest person. No comment. (laughs) I feel like, and I wrote about this in my um, newsletter before, but I used to be a pain addict. Like I was addicted to pain and when pain didn't exist, I would self-create Explain that. Give an example. Because I feel like that's a kind of an odd statement to make that you're a pain addict. Right. It's not like I was like self-harming in that kind of way, but it felt like emotional pain was something that I knew how to get myself through, like sadness, depression, um, uncertainty, 
fear. And so like, that's the place like of my inner childhood trauma that I had to learn to work myself through. And that was such a prominent piece of my childhood. And I don't mean that in a bad way, because it's not like I had a terrible childhood by any means, but it was a, a piece of my childhood that I learned how to navigate. And I think in the process of this, I got really safe in understanding how to get through pain. And when things weren't painful, what like when we were being, when life was happy and joy filled and there wasn't concerns or uncertainty, that felt way more uncertain to me than the uncertainty of the fear of what if, or this might be going bad, if that makes sense. Like I was always waiting for the other shoe to drop whenever things were good. Like that just didn't feel normal to me in all aspects, like in friendships, uh, you know, growing up as a kid, like all of these areas, I had just learned to be really safe in these uncomfortable places because that is where I felt like I could survive. I didn't know how to thrive in places that were happy and times that were good. And so now as an adult, I still find myself like almost self-sabotaging when things are going well. Like yesterday, for instance, you kind of called me out and you're like, maybe you should start taking account of all the things that are going well instead of spending so much time focusing on the things that aren't going well. And it's just so unnatural for me because when things are going well, it feels like such a big threat to me that I tend to self-sabotage and I find things to fixate on that aren't good because in the aren't good, like in the scary places, that's where I feel like I can keep myself alive. I feel like I have more control in the pain than I do in the joy. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I mean, I've done a lot of work in counseling about this issue. And I mean, again, I think it's just like the idea that what maybe kept me alive, and we've talked about this before, we've heard it on a sermon, like what kept you alive in childhood can be completely dysfunctional as an adult when you're no longer needing to survive in that kind of way. But happiness has always felt really scary to me. Like it's like something like the world tells you to strive for, but honestly, it's absolutely terrifying to feel like happy and joy filled. Like for me, like to process through that, even to say that, like happiness is scary. And I know not everyone's going to understand that. But I think there are people out there who are like, yeah, I totally get that. Like, right? Like, I totally get the fact that I don't know that I want to be happy. You feel safer when things aren't going well? Yeah, because it turns into this form of self-protection, right? Like, I know how to protect myself. I know how to get myself through it. But I feel like to truly be happy, there's like this interconnectedness with other people. Like, I don't think that we'll ever, and and research shows this, right? Like, that we'll ever be happy alone. Um, Humans were created for interconnectedness, like interdependence. We are created for dependence and interdependence. And this is really hard to understand in the independent world that we live in. But that independence is not actually joy-filled. It's not actually happiness because it takes connections and interdependence on other people to actually produce the joy-filled feelings that we're looking for. Like think about oxytocin. Like oxytocin is that feel-good hormone. And yeah, at the same time, oxytocin is rarely stimulated without interacting with someone else. It's stimulated by a hug, by affection by uh, the warm feelings. Like, could you watch a movie and produce oxytocin? Sure. Could you give yourself a foot massage and produce oxytocin? Sure. But not to the degree in which it takes, or not to the degree in which oxytocin is produced when you're connecting with someone else. And that's not just intimately. Like, that's just like living life with other people is way more powerful than living life alone. So I think when it comes to like, why is happiness scary to me? It's because I almost feel like you have to trust another person, not to make you happy, which I feel like is also another misconception, right? Is like, I married you because I thought you could make me happy. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> this is a horrible misbelief, right? Like another human cannot make us happy, but we have to understand that they can aid in our happiness. Yeah. So as you were talking through that, I just opened up another window on my computer and just did a 
a search to see what the definition of happy is. Because I, I looked at happiness, which is what we're talking about, but it said the act of being happy. So obviously then I went to look at happy and it said feeling or showing pleasure or contentment. And I was like, wow, contentment. That's not something you normally would think of when you think of the word happy. And it made me think of what you were talking right. about, which is like sometimes when you have that feeling of happiness, just being content with that feeling and like staying in it is just as difficult as finding happiness. Like once you found it, just mm -hmm. holding it and being content with feeling that. I mean, that, I feel like that's what you're describing is you almost struggle with being content with that feeling. Right. Yeah. You struggle sitting in it. And I think partly because, and what we, what I wrote in the planner, it's like the big shift for me in understanding happiness is happiness is not a destination. It's not like getting more money is going to make you happier. Could you do things that do produce happiness if you had more money? Sure. But the art of money, like getting money isn't making you happier. A lot of people would say it actually makes people more miserable getting to your goal way. Like it's like health. It's not a place you arrive because when we get there, we think that we're going to stay there. But that's not what happiness is. Like all feelings, happiness is actually very fleeting. It's not something that's like, if I arrive at this place, I'm going to forever be happy. Like that's, that's not how any feeling. It feels work. like <laughs> what I was visualizing as you're saying that is it's not like you're climbing a mountain and happiness is at the top. And it's like, you have to work to get there. And once you're there, like you can decide if you want to stay there or not. Um, but mm. it's not, that's not how it works. It's not just a continual path that you go and then you achieve happiness and you get to stay there. It's like you said, it's something that's, it's constantly coming and going based on the circumstances of what's happening in your life. Cause you could have a right. super happy day and somebody cuts you off on the highway and all of a sudden that instantly changes things. It, it doesn't mean that you're now not a happy person, but it's your reaction to the situation you're in that may have caused you to, to change emotions. Right. At first, I want to say someone cutting me off on the interstate would never make me upset because I always think that's probably me to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> Not because they're doing it on purpose, but because they're Mis oblivious. Mr. Road Rage. Um, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, if you're basically saying like, if you're not happy climbing the mountain, you're never going to be happy on the mountaintop. Like it's never going to produce what you expect it to. Like there's an expectation that when we arrive, we're going to be happy. And sometimes that expectation alone can completely sabotage you. So you don't experience it. Like the, the true art of being happy is understanding happy is happiness is not a place. It's a feeling. And a feeling is fleeting. It's temporary. It can come and go. Um, but it also means it's something that you can create. Will you experience other feelings? Like when someone cuts you off and you get angry, that doesn't mean you can't not also experience happiness. Like feelings are not, they're fleeting, they're temporary, but you can experience them like a multitude of feelings at the same time. You can experience sadness and happiness almost simultaneously. It seemed bizarre and crazy, um, but that's where we get into like obviously a much deeper conversation. But when we go back to this idea, again, like I like your mountaintop thing. It's like, if you really want to be happy, you have to choose to understand the process and the journey of life is part of that. That's really where happiness is built, not in arriving. So like if you're trying to climb this mountaintop to make more money and fill your bank account and you think if you arrive there, you're going to be happy, but you're not happy in the process of getting there, like you're never going to be happy there. Maybe just like a temporary happiness, but you're never going to build a happiness that is true happiness. And that's just really a choice. It's a choice to be happy. <laughs> it's choosing happiness, which is really hard for someone who's a pain addict to be like, I'm going to choose happiness today. <laughs> That's scary. But you're on the other side. You're like, my glass is overflowing and everything is beautiful. <laughs> I'm always happy. And you make me want to vomit sometimes. <laughs> but it, that that conversation made me think back to the very first one that we did together, how to become healthier. 
And in that, we spent a lot of time talking about how health is not a destination. Like if health or weight loss or whatever your goal is, is that same thing on the top of the mountain. The idea of health is the process that you take to get to that location. Just the same thing we're talking about here with just a different subject, but the idea behind it is the exact same. It's you have to choose to enjoy and be happy in the process and not act like I have to do all of these things and then I'll be happy. It's not a conditional action. Mm -hmm. It's enjoying the process on the way. And you can say, you know, you combine those two, you combine what we talked about in January and what we're talking about now. And, you know, you're, you're trying to achieve a goal for your health, be happy achieving health in the process of meeting your goal. I mean, that's really the core Mm -hmm. when we talk about happiness and health and some of these other subjects, that's really what I think you're trying to get to. Right. 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 And, and I don't think happiness is necessarily the goal of life. I think that the goal of life is to experience the the range of emotions that we as humans have honor really of feeling. And I think it's just feeling all of them and allowing yourself to really feel them. And I think sometimes when we put happiness on this pedestal, we actually like, it's like the backwards law, right? The more you try to achieve it, the more unhappy you're going to be. <laughs> and and I think it's because we put so much emphasis into being happy that we miss it because we're trying to chase and, and we're trying to run after things that really don't produce the happiness that we're expecting them to because external things really don't have that power. Instead of just understanding that it's in our ability to choose happiness, to create it. And that also is going to come from feeling all the feelings. Like there's a lot of um, research in the emotional field that says like the people who experience the most happiness are the ones who actually have felt the most pain. So it's like, um, and I think, is it Victor Franklin? He was a Holocaust survivor and he wrote this book later and it essentially said like he feels like he experienced some of the greatest joys in life because of his time experiencing some of the deepest pains, like going through the process of understanding those deepest pains on the flip side, allowed him to see life in a new way. It allowed him to see life in a more joy filled, happy, grateful kind of way versus the people who avoid all pain and try to run away from it really feel like maybe they don't experience the greatest happiness because they're so concerned about not being unhappy that they can never be happy. But I think that's probably, and I go back to the the comment you made before um, my last, my last statement was, you know, you said, I'm always a glass half full. Everything's always positive, all of that. But sometimes if you stay in that consistency in that like middle ground, and you don't experience the lows, then the highs don't have the same impact. And so I feel like that's right. kind of also what you're saying is, you know, if if you experience this really deep low, you also have the ability to experience a much higher high with that happiness. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. that I think is part of the key thing too, is acknowledging when things are terrible, because that allows you to mm-hmm. acknowledge and feel when things are actually good and you get to experience that, that happiness along the journey. Are you preaching to yourself right now? Maybe. (laughs) Yes. Because you're like, you're right. Because I think your glass is half full, but you're really very even. Like you're just so even keeled. Like you don't have a lot of highs and you don't have a lot of lows, but that is your protection mechanism. You don't feel pain and you don't feel joy. You just feel nothing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Nothing at all. That's a better, that, there's a better way to say that. Okay. But you're right. Like we have, this is where emotional IQ comes in. And emotional IQ is at the understanding that it's not about preventing yourself from feeling. It's about being able to experience your feelings without being controlled by your feelings. So it's being able to experience the low, low places and being able to sit there without being completely controlled by that place. And what I mean by that is a lot of times when people get to these low places where they're feeling depressed, anxious, overwhelmed, um, all the things, we tend to run, we tend to sabotage, we tend to escape, we tend to numb, right? All of those things so we don't have to feel that place. So we 
you know, do drugs and uh, get addicted to things because we get that dopamine hit to get ourselves out of the place that we hate to feel these temporary places, but that's not emotional IQ. And it's the same on the flip side. Like some people can experience these high highs and, um, there's actually some, some thought that when you experience those high highs, people tend to get stuck there because they want to live there. And these are like the people who, you know, like live for their glory days in high school and they talk about it all the time and they tend to wear the same clothes from high school and they have the same personality and the same haircuts and they literally get stuck in their high moments. Like they can't fathom life without being in that place. So they basically um, subconsciously just continuously living in that their quote unquote glory days, but that prevents them from living in the present moment. So we see it on both sides. That's emotional dysregulation and emotional dysregulation always needs to be regulated in some way. And if we don't learn how to do that in a positive way, we'll always find it in an unhealthy pattern. This is where most people live. This is what the work I've had to do because I feel like my emotional dysregulation is when I feel really high, I self-sabotage to get really low. And when I get really low, I just like to sulk there. Like I like everyone to know my life is hard. Mostly just you. Mostly just (laughs) me. Yeah, that's, that's true. But like the emotional dysregulation is to recognize like, I know this is how I'm feeling right now. And... I can feel that, but I don't have to be controlled by that. And what I mean by controlled by that is like, I can feel something without needing to act in that something. I think when we go back to like the contentment, right? Like I can be content here without being complacent here. And I used to think contentment and complacent, complacency were like very similar. Like if I feel like I'm okay here, then nothing's ever going to change. But contentment is not saying that it's always forever going to be this way. Complacency is saying, I'm here, I'm just going to be stuck here. And you kind of like just sulk in that place of complacency where you don't do anything to change. Contentment is not a, a complacency. Contentment is a growth word. It's, I'm going to be content here, but I'm also going to work on creating and growing and moving forward. Contentment is a word of growth. It's a movement. It's a flow. Complacency is a stuck word. It's stagnancy. Don't miss you contentment and complacency. Like I can be content in this place, even though this isn't exactly where I want to be, knowing that I can continuously create and grow and learn and better myself so that I can move into a new space. Complacency is like, huh, you know, it's just genetic or I'm always going to be fat. Like it's just the way it is, right? Like those are complacency statements. Like I'm never going to be happy. I'm just an anxious person. We start to label ourselves and create beliefs about ourselves and these places that are lows or even highs. And we just get ourselves stuck there. But stuck is the worst place to be because then we'll never create any emotional IQ and we'll really never experience the true benefit of happiness. Well, one of the things you wrote in the planner that I think goes with that is happiness is holding space for all emotions, even the hard ones. And I think that kind of is the definition of contentment, like being willing to sit in and have that feeling of happiness, even when things might be difficult, even when things might be going wrong. And that's that's really hard to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really hard to hold the space in those harder places. But I think that's really where happiness is birthed out of is just being able to allow yourself to experience all the emotions, the range of emotions, but again, not being controlled by them. Because I feel like even in my pain addiction, like I allowed the that to control my livelihood. Like I allowed my feelings to dictate what I what I did. And we see this all the time, like in the health space. People emotionally eat. Even yesterday, I think you you said, are you emotionally eating <laughs> those bunions right I did. <laughs> They're not even that good. But yeah, I was like, absolutely, I am. Like, it's, you're still going to have those moments where you are controlled by your emotions. But sometimes the best place to start is to just be aware of the fact of like, I am right now not hungry, but I'm just eating because I feel something. And my feelings make me feel like I deserve to do something. <laughs> but that feeling you know, is really dictating me. It's not me dictating my feeling. There's a book called The Untethered Soul. And I, it's a a valuable book for people to read. It was one of the the more thought-provoking books that I've ever read. 
Um, but it's this idea that we hold on to too many things. And holding on to too many things, I'm paraphrasing all of this because he's written it in a much different way. But holding on to too many things makes you stuck in those things, right? Like the more our body and our brain has to hold on to, like our emotions, like our past, like our feelings, the more stuck we get in those things because we almost like congest our being, we congest our mind, we congest everything. And so things don't flow as freely. But when we look at health, And when we look at emotions and when we look at a lot of things in life, it's supposed to be more of like this currency. Like health is your currency. Energy is your currency. Money is a currency. And currency has a flow, right? Currency is, the definition of currency is like a current in a river. It's a flow or a movement. And I think we fail to see this in life is that it's a movement, it's motion, it's flow, it's doing, it's living, it's going. It's these action words. And the same thing is true with health and feeling. They're 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 action words, but they're supposed to flow. And so, and we can see this, right? If someone else is having a bad day, a lot of times their attitude flows into you and it can make you have a bad day, right? Like we see this this transfer of emotions. But the idea inside the book was that we tend to hold on to too many things and we get ourselves stuck there and we create these patterns inside of our body that are unhealthy, stuck patterns. Um, And he said one of the best ways to get it out of is learning how to let yourself feel things without ever feeling the need to hold on to them. So it's you feel them and you let it go. You feel it and you let it go. Like you experience it and you let it go. You, uh, um, You talk about it, but then you let it go. Like we just stop holding on to anything and we just let things move through us. Like we just get rid of what doesn't serve us and we really just let it go. And that's hard if you've ever experienced like negative emotions or any sort of bitterness, right? Unforgiveness, those are very big stuck emotions and they're having a massive negative impact on your biology. Like they're completely changing the hormonal hierarchy of your body and your brain. And again, creating these unhealthy patterns that keep these emotions stuck in your body. So the idea is like, it's not that you can't feel sadness. It's you allow yourself to feel it, but then you move yourself through it and you release it. It's not that you can't feel or think that thought. It's that, okay, I'm thinking that thought, but if that thought's not healthy or is not serving me, or even if it is healthy, like think it and let it go. Like the idea of like letting things in and letting things out, like letting them move through you is so much healthier than these stuck patterns that we get ourselves into. The biggest thing for me that I've been thinking through as you're talking is how do we balance? Because we talked about, you know, like you almost have to experience the lows to really feel what happiness feels like. Like, how do you balance? Because you struggle with when you do feel happiness to get yourself like self sabotage to get to kind of a neutral or kind of feeling bad about yourself position. So, how do you feel like you can balance needing in a way to? experience some of those lows in order to feel the happiness, but not keeping yourself stuck in that low place for too long. I feel like all of change is just those like micro little things that you can do to recreate patterns. That sounds, of that sounds really fancy. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, I think they're actually called glimmers. So you give yourself little glimmers of what you're trying to do. Glimmers are small moments that spark joy or peace, which can help cue our nervous system to feel safe or calm. So there's actually a a medical term called glimmers in psychology that are these small, tiny moments that spark joy. (laughs) Who said spark joy? Is it spark joy? If things don't spark your joy. What's that show? It's like the minimalist show on Netflix. Marie Kondo. I didn't watch it, you know, but that's what I think about Um, Anyways, so we have to remember inside of our brain that if things are feel unsafe, if positivity feels unsafe for me, I will always divert to negativity. That's the pattern inside of our subconscious. And the only way to break that is one through awareness, through consistency and through safety. So in order to change our patterns, we have to insert a level of safety. So it might not make sense. Like it doesn't make sense that happiness would spark fear inside my brain, but for whatever reason it does. And now that I know this, it's like, okay, but if I try to make myself too happy, right? Like if I set this goal and then I achieve it and I try to reach this destination or I just try to force positivity on myself, it doesn't 
work. You can't just think yourself better. You have to um, create a level of safety with inside the positivity. And this is where the glimmers come in. It's the little glimmers of things that make you make you see joy and, and happiness, but in very, very small ways. All change happens in really, really small ways at first. So it's like, okay, uh, going outside and going on a walk. Sometimes I try to do this with myself. Like I'll look around and be like, I'm really thankful to live here. Or like you just let yourself feel the joy of the sun hitting your skin or you smell the fresh air and you're like, oh, I'm really grateful for that. Like that makes me really happy. So it's like all these little tiny moments throughout the day that you're just living aware. You're giving yourself little glimmers of like that felt good. That was joy filled. That was happy. And you just start reminding yourself of these little glimmers that you have. Sometimes for me, it's something as small as like sitting in the sunlight at lunchtime and like letting it hit my skin. You know this. Yeah. Like you call me a cat. For me, it's like I'll just go browse through the library. Like something about just walking through the sea of books is like, oh my gosh, this brings me so much joy. Like reading, you know, has been a huge one for me is like when I stop trying to make myself, um, feel like I had to read all of these books in a month, like set a book goal to read all these books. And I just started reading for the joy of reading. Like when I just started reading, I feel like I just go through so many books because it gives me so much joy now. When it comes to people, those are bigger threats of unsafe for me. So glimmers rarely have to do with anything with another human being. Because another human being feels like they get to dictate who how I feel. Like I, I'm like feel really feel like I'm an empath in that way. I've had a hard time not letting other people's emotions dictate mine. So people are really threatening to me. So glimmers in my understanding should not be humans. They should be things in nature, things that you are just doing in the silence of your own life. In a sense, learning how to create that safety within yourself without letting other human beings dictate that. I was going to say you. you forgot one. What? Taking a bath. Yeah, that's, I know. That's one of those things but that it, I feel like you combine bath and reading and those have become two things that I feel like you go to to just right. find but a Right, but here's place. the thing. You can't let the act be the glimmer. The glimmer has to be something within the act that makes you feel happy. So it's like, I love the warmth. (laughs) You're giggling. I love the way the warmth like makes me feel. I love feeling the physical pages of my book and flipping a page. Like finding the little glimmers within the act. The act of walking, yes, does produce happiness. But what inside the walk am I experiencing as little glimmers? Like I said, that's like the way the fresh air smells or like looking around at life, feeling like I'm blessed to just live here and um, the way that the sun hits my skin. Like those are the little glimmers that you have. Another little glimmer of mine is like, I love getting into a hot car. Feeling the warmth of that (laughs) is just like so, it feels like a warm hug. You hate it. And I'm like, ah a lot of our safety is going to come from our senses. And so when you think about a glimmer, it's what sense is igniting a pleasurable response, a micro pleasure response. Because when we talk about pleasure, a lot of people think we have to go to these big extremes to experience pleasure. We should be able to experience pleasure in the littlest of things all throughout the day. The little glimmers that I feel like with wisdom, we start to gain more understanding and more appreciation for the little things in life. Um, But if we could capture that in our younger years, I think it would make us a lot happier because I think we miss so much of that. Yeah. I feel like, I mean, it's, it's spring in Iowa, which means that it goes from 80 degrees with a strong South wind to 40 degrees with a strong North wind. And Yesterday, I was sitting in my truck in kind of a quiet place and I was just, everything was off and I was just listening to the wind just whip through the windows and whip around and hit the trees and watch everything sway. And I was like, you know what? It is kind of an amazing thing thinking about wind as an Mm -hmm. example. But that to me yesterday was kind of that grounding glimmer of Mm -hmm. like, huh. Yeah, it's one of those things that we've complained about for the last month, but Mm -hmm. it is one of those things that like kind of an unexplained thing that we interact with every day that we just take for granted. Yeah, 
I feel like it's like being awestruck again, like the childlike mm-hmm. wonder. Yeah. Those, so here's, those are the little here's glimmers. A, so here's a deep question that I just thought of while you mm-hmm. were talking. Is the question, what makes you happy, even a valid question? I think it is just because I feel like understanding like health is something that you create. So, and sometimes when you're feeling upset or, or you're having a hard time, it's like, okay, rebalancing that hard emotion has to come from something positive, right? Like our body and our mind are always working for a homeostatic balance. And so pulling your body back into balance is understanding like, okay, I had a hard day, but I know that Um, taking hot bath makes me happy. And maybe like happiness can feel like a really cheesy surface level answer, right? I think there's so much deeper things that are happening on that level that it's more like, I think what we call happiness, a lot of times it's just a grounding force. It's like almost grounding you to say like, I, I am still safe even though this experience is happening. I think happiness feels like this overwhelming... And, and maybe this is where we get into the difference between happiness and joy, right? Like some people think they're the same thing. Some people think that they're very different things. I would say that they're different things. I think happiness is more of a feeling. It's fleeting. Joy is more of an emotion. Um, it's more of a, a pattern inside your brain and body. And so maybe when I say what makes you happy, it's maybe You're what we're really looking saying for what is, brings you joy. What brings you joy. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think we'll always all have things that make us happy. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. Like I grew up with the theology of if you're not suffering, you're not saved. And I, there's, that can be further from like the biblical aspect of who Jesus is. Um, But that was really hard for me. And I think that he, like when we look biblically, like we were created to experience all of the feelings and all of the emotions. And, um, happiness is really healing. Like joy is really healing internally to our body and to our system. It's a gift. It's, it gives us life. It gives us desire and purpose and pleasure. And it keeps us running back to that. That's why like a lot of the things that are needed for our survival, like food and reproduction and shelter and, and community, though, those are incredibly pleasurable and joy-filled experiences in I don't think that we should take away from that because that's the gift and the act of that, but it's learning how to not be controlled by them, how to use them in a healthy and a positive way that actually produces joy, not this temporary fix. But I I think that, yeah, happiness is a part of being human. It's just the right perspective. I thought it was kind of interesting. You didn't mention spending time with other people in your glimmers. Well, that's what, because I said glimmers shouldn't be human based because a lot of times we're feeling, um, we're feeling very threatened. Like our safety mechanisms are going to be more threatened by humans than pretty much anything else because most people have been traumatized by humans. So how do you balance that with your comment towards the beginning where you talked about the need for community and connection? Right. We are interdependent people. We are dependent upon other people and relationships and, you know, God essentially, right? Like having that, that spiritual aspect of it. But I think when it comes to recreating safety patterns, for most people, people are going to feel threatening. And so it's going to be harder to experience. Like we are more apt to let other people dictate our emotions than we are to understand how we self-create it. So what a glimmer is doing is it's trying to help you in the quiet of your own life, trying to help you reprocess through emotions to create these new subconscious patterns that are just happy, that are joy-filled outside of what other people are feeling. So that when you interact with other people, you're no longer necessarily taking their emotions or trying to, or feeling like you're being dictated by their emotions or trying to dictate someone else's emotions. You just are because you've created these new safe subconscious patterns. Like when we're unsafe and we don't have those glimmers, like we are going to be dictated by other people and we're also going to try to dictate how other people feel. Hurt people hurt people, right? Why do hurt people hurt people? Because they have no other option but to try and transfer your joy and steal it from you, like your happiness and steal it from you because that's how they're trying to rebalance themselves. 
Like we're all working for rebalance. Glimmers are trying to show you, you don't need other people to rebalance you. You need other people to fully benefit from the joy-filled life that we were created for. I shouldn't come to you looking for you to make me happy. If I came to you because I already was happy, that's a completely different ballgame. So we need other people because that aids in our happiness. That is a pleasure response. But if we're not first happy ourselves outside of other people, we're always going to be trying to transfer that energy, trying to transfer that emotion. So the glimmers come in and say like, yes, maybe some of you, when you get, when you build bigger glimmers and you start to work through this process, then it's like, oh, I held the door for a stranger. I waved to someone like those can be great little glimmers. But I think for a lot of people starting out with the, the non-relational glimmers is always going to be safer yeah, that makes sense. than the relational I was just, ones. I was just thinking about your long walks with friends or things like that. Like for you, that's, that's a, a connecting point that I feel like mm-hmm. makes you happy. But I will say that. I do recognize when you take on the emotion of somebody else, if they're having a bad day or they're going through a difficult situation, you tend to not come home feeling the same as if you're just having a light, fun conversation. And so that that does that does make sense if you think yeah. about it from that perspective. I think we need to be more grounded in our world outside of humans so that we can more positively impact and and interact with humans. Like, I think we're all a lot of loose cannons walking around the world. And really all we're doing is harming. That's a pretty strong statement. (laughs) I mean, I think because so many of us are emotionally unstable and I'm, I'm no different. It's hard when you're emotionally unstable to think, to brush off what someone else said to you or did to you and to really see the compassion through it. And I think this is one thing that therapy really helped me do with the pain addiction and like letting other people dictate my feelings and kind of being an empath is like, it was really hard for me to have compassion for the people who hurt me. And I think unless you're fully grounded outside of other humans, you'll never be able to experience compassion for someone who hurt you. Because then it's always revenge. Yeah bitterness it's unforgiveness right like you have to be grounded in something outside of another being human being so that you can then see beyond their flaws see beyond that to recognize they probably didn't intentionally hurt you they might have hurt you because all they know is hurt they might have hurt you because all they experience is hurt and like i talk to the girls a lot about this is like you know one of our girls gets has gotten made fun of quite a bit in the past and Um, I hate to call it bullying because I feel like that just ignites the victim mindset, which is just a spiral on its own, but it's helping them to say like, no, this isn't okay. You have every right to feel how you feel, but also if we can see through this a little bit to recognize on the other side, do you think this kid who's bullying you, who's talking poorly about you, who's saying these things about you, do you think too, maybe they've been told bad things about them? Do you think they too are getting made fun of? Do you think life at home is maybe necessarily the best for them? Do you think they might be hurting too? And not to say that to excuse the behavior, but I think when we start to soften it to other people, we stop allowing their hurt to hurt us. It's not to excuse them. It's to say, you know what? That was hurtful. That was painful, but I don't have to accept that as reality. I recognize you're just slurring those insults at me because that's what you know, because you're hurting. Yeah. And that's not true about me. Does that make sense? Having compassion for the person who hurt you is, yes, loving them, but it's also loving yourself because it stops letting those things be your reality. And it recognizes that that's not true. That's just someone trying to take from you what they're not finding from anyone else. Yeah, that's really good. Like there's like this whole, like, I think, I think when we look at it, like energy and emotions, it sounds really woo woo, but all energy has frequency, like a radio frequency, right? Like everything in life is carrying some kind of emotional freak or energetic frequency and emotions have a frequency. Think about when the person cut you off in traffic and you had anger, you probably felt this, like almost this excited energy rush, right? (laughs) <laughs> I don't know what road rage is like for you. I don't experience road rage. So this is a hard one for me to understand. I'm the person who ignites road rage and other people probably because I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I just cut someone off. 
I always try to remind you, remember, the person who cut it you off, it could have been, could have been just you. accidentally unaware. But w- then if you get into something that's like deep sadness, deep sadness is exhausting. It's draining. Negative emotions are energetically draining. But then when you're like positive and you're happy and you're laughing, like that's a high energy frequency. And there's all these different frequencies of emotions that we know. And I'll post it over on the blog post so that you can see this. And we recognize that there are healing frequencies and there are damaging frequencies. And a lot of these negative emotions are very damaging to our system because they're functioning at a lower energetic frequency than our homeostatic balance, which means our body is constantly trying to conserve, store, and hoard energy to try to rebalance the negative frequency that it's interacting with. It's basically taking all of your energy to deal with that negative energy response, and it's down-regulating every function of your body. And we have massive um, hormonal uh, players here like cortisol and adrenaline, things like that, to help you move through this process, to help you rebalance that energy. But we have to know that as long as we're in those negative states and prolonged periods, we're going to have a negative biological effect to that. And in the process, we're going to also start looking for our environment to rebalance that energy. And we'll look for this in food. Why do people come for eat when they're stressed? Because they're looking for food for energy to rebalance the negative response, to try and bring the body back into a homeostatic balance. We eat for comfort, yes, but also for energy. Why do people hurl insults at other people? Why do other people, like when they're having a bad day, they want to make someone else have a bad day? Because they recognize the person that they're trying to make have a bad day is probably having a good day. So if I can steal your energy, people wouldn't call it that. But essentially, I'm trying to get you to give me some of your energy. If I can get you worked up, now I get some of your energy. We have this massive transfer of energy. There's this difference between giving someone energy and while protecting your own energy and just throwing your energy away at someone else. And we're really bad about giving energy while protecting energy. So a hug is one of the ways that you can give someone energy while actually continuously being filled of your own energy. It's a give and get kind of situation, not a get, give and lose. Throwing an insult back at someone is a give and lose. You're not only hurting them, but you're hurting yourself. When you give someone a hug when they're having a bad day to say like, I know you're really upset. Look, I'm telling you what I want when I'm having a bad day. (laughs) I will take your insult. I will take your, like, I will give you an insult to get something back. The healthiest thing that you could give back to me is something that also protects your energy. So things that would protect your energy while you're giving to someone else is like acknowledging that they're feeling upset. Sometimes just acknowledging someone is upset actually gives them energy. It's giving them a compliment. It's giving them a hug. It's helping them process through that emotion. It's helping them to remind them of these little glimmers in life so that they can start to rebalance themselves with their own positive emotion. And saying like, I recognize you're having a bad day. Would you like to go on a walk? I, you know, like, doing something to create this energy within them so they're not constantly looking for it in other things. That seems really simple, but really powerful. Yeah. It is simple. We complicate it because, because we have to be healthy. Yeah, you have to, you have to be in a, obviously you have to be in a positive energy state in order to give. And you have to be grounded yourself, you know, like you can't, you can't protect your energy and to give to someone else at the same time. You can't help someone through something if you're not grounded yourself without completely sabotaging yourself. You have to do the work to be grounded yourself. And I think this is really what we need to be. Like if we were all more grounded in who we are and what we were created for and and finding these little glimmers. And I think, again, this is where uh, the soul the sole aspect comes into this is huge player in health is because that allows us to be grounded in something outside of other people who we like to let dictate us. Like we are no longer dictated by what other people say to us or what other people try to do to us, but we are just so grounded in who we are that in the process of that, we have so much to give to other people. It's like you're being filled from the top down instead of looking for all these outside sources to fill you. Like you're just filled so that you can give. It's the endless supply of filling that you have when you're grounded so that you can go out and yeah, get that. Yeah, because one of the things 
Because one of the things and that that's I true was happiness. Thinking about too is kind of asking you the question: Can you overcome that self sabotage that you talked about to get to a place where you feel more happiness? But I feel like you just answered that. I mean, if you if you're grounded in who yeah. you are and you are filled up to where you can give to others, then you your tendency to fall back into those self sabotaging patterns will just start to disappear because you're living in a higher energy mm-hmm. state of willingness to give to others. What you know that you always talk about like, Oh man, that person's cup mm-hmm. is overflowing. I mean, that's really what you're talking about is being in a state where you're not, you, maybe you're not yeah. this like over the top bubbly personality that somebody looks at you and is like, Oh man, they're, they're overflowing with energy, but you're, you're just in that constant state of, happiness and contentment that you're you're just grounded in who you are and what your purpose is and you're just freely giving that to other people like you're filled up in order to to give to others like you can't you right. can't fill somebody else up when you're empty and i think that that's a that's a key point yeah right i think that's a great analogy too coming back to that when you're genuinely have a cup overfilled People are going to see that because they're going to experience that. You're really going to influence everyone around you, not because you're being prideful in it, but this is really where the true confidence and true happiness and true joy comes from is like, you don't even have to think of yourself because you're so grounded in who you are. And this is really where we want to get, but you have to be grounded in yourself And if we go back to the glimmers, that's what we have to recognize is that we have to find that outside other people. Yes, we have to interact with other humans and be interdependent with each other, but only when we're fully grounded in ourselves. So for instance, yesterday I was having a bad day and I was kind of struggling in my own circle of self-sabotage and eating Funyuns and eating Funyuns and pity me. And I wasn't doing a lot. I was being very unproductive and I was looking for you to help me, which which in those moments, it's really hard. Like there's nothing you can do to help me with your words. Maybe a hug would be nice. <laughs> but noted. Um, I said, I think I'm going to go for a walk. And then I kind of spe- like stewed about it because I'm like, oh, I should be working. I should be getting something done. I wasn't getting anything done. And you're like, no, just go for a walk. And it was like, you just, again, pointing me in that direction. And when I went for a walk, I put on a podcast that was like a soul-based podcast, like a, a sermon from the week. And I just like, again, just paid attention to my surroundings of like, what felt good. Like I was just looking for those little glimmers of like, oh, wow, that flowering tree is really pretty. Or like, I'm going to go down this way or like that house, like that yard is, you know, really beautiful or like just trying to find these little tiny glimmers. And I feel so refreshed when I do that. It's like, again, coming back to that grounding space, felt like I came home with a new perspective, a new attitude. And today I woke up feeling really well. Yeah. I feel like in the winter, it was always just go take a bath. Yeah. And now that it's nicer outside, it's like, just go take a walk. <laughs> yeah. I think, I, I mean, we need to wrap this up. We always go really long. But I think there are some, um, I was listening to some podcasts on grief. And one thing that's really interesting about grief, and I know we're talking about happiness, but uh, I think this really sums up how people feel and experience things is so unique and personal to them. And one thing that they were talking about grief is that when we understand pain, we have to understand that no one actually understands the level of pain of someone else. Like no pain is identical. It's like a snowflake, right? It's all completely unique to your personality or to you and your experiences and what you've been through, right? So pain to you is going to look incredibly different to me. And what's fascinating is when we see people in grief and in pain, a lot of people don't want to, aren't safe enough or protected enough of themselves where they can actually allow someone to to sit in pain with someone else. So a lot of times when we see people in pain, we're like, it's going to be okay. Or, you know, it's, it's going to get better. And we try to rationalize because we are so unsafe with our own emotion that we start to rationalize with someone else's grief, trying to basically suppress it or tell them to suppress it because we can't handle it. It's very rare when you see someone who can actually just sit in your pain with you without feeling threatened by it. And 
I was always fascinated by that because I think it goes back to happiness too. It's like we can portray this artificial happiness, but I think really when we actually achieve a state of happiness and we experience it again, it's a fleeting state. So it's not achieving a state, but it's that fleeting, fleeting thing that you can create. It's going to come down to being able to sit with people and let people feel their feelings without feeling threatened by them. Like, Getting to a state of happiness is being less threatened by the emotions of other people and being more secure in your own. This got a lot deeper than I anticipated, but I thought that was interesting because emotions are very personal. They're very unique. And how you feel happiness is not how I'm going to feel happiness, and I should not expect to feel the same. I feel like that's what we say every month, though didn't know that we were going to get that deep on the subject but i think if if people cuz here's the joy that i have in doing these like when we first started in january i was just like scared like i can't do this this isn't something that i even wanted to do but i feel like as we continue to do it i recognize the knowledge that you have and how fun it is to just ask questions and learn myself as i'm going through this and i'm like I don't know how many conversations we've had about a lot of deep subjects. I've never heard you talk about glimmers before. And I feel like that's a really, that's a really key thing when we're talking about happiness that I think is, is a powerful way to, to approach this subject. So I'm glad that you had that, uh, got to find a little sparkle in your life, babe. I'm not a very sparkly (laughs) person, so I guess, uh, Now we'll figure Uh, that out. Today, you're going to find all the sparkle in the world. But it is, I mean, like I said, yesterday is just like recognizing just something as simple as the wind. And I feel like now it's just kind of reminding, reminding myself of just those little things like around us that we can recognize that just ground us and remind us of the joy that we can have that I think it was a really Mm -hmm. powerful, helpful thing. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So everyone needs to look for their glimmers today and start to take note of it. It's not something you need to write down. It's just something you need to pay attention to. But I challenge you today to look for a few glimmers in your own life. And if you find them, um, let us know. Leave a comment on the blog or on social media or get on the newsletter send us back a comment. I'm going to be talking more about glimmers over there since this is a newer subject. Sometimes I forget what I've talked about. And I'm like, oh, we've talked about glimmers before, but I don't know that we actually have here. And I also have to say, I can only know this stuff because I have lived through it, right? Like I have gone through a massive healing journey, which I used to be really bitter about, but I feel like it has allowed me to understand and to dive deep into these subjects and to really understand them in a new way so that I can better help you. But I want you to know, I'm not just knowing this, I'm living this with you and I'm struggling and I'm fighting through it. And I hope that you're doing the same. It's just choosing to live. And that's really what the living well is for me. It's not a place to arrive, but it's just a place for you to enjoy the journey and to experience life more fully. Or next month on the podcast, when you come back on, we're going to talk about the month of June, how to get healthy. And we're also going to dive deep into our experience with blood sugar monitoring. (laughs) Mind blown. It has been a crazy experience. That has been something I'm incredibly grateful for. But you just put a blood glucose monitor on not that long ago. And so you're gathering your data. And next month, we're going to talk about what we learned what we liked about it, what we didn't like about it, and what we're going to do moving yeah. forward. Because yeah, you're shocked for too. Sure. It's, <laughs> it's been a challenging first <laughs> yeah. five days or so that I've been been monitoring this. So yeah, it, I'm, I'm super interested at the end of the 30 days to, uh, to talk about it and see, uh, see what happens. But we're also going to talk about how to get healthy on that podcast and why this whole process for us has been important and what you can learn from that. Okay, so we will be back next week. Don't forget to head to the blog at thelivingwell.com where you can see the emotional frequency chart. We're going to talk a little bit more about glimmers over there. And also get on my email list called The Weekly Fill where we talk more in depth about the podcast. I give you challenges, weekly meal plans, 
So much stuff is happening over there. We're excited to move to a new platform for it where you can experience more content from me and also get engaged through leaving comments, communicating through those emails. It's just gonna be a lot of fun. So make sure you head to the weekly fill as we start moving things over for the summer months. And don't forget this summer, we have a brand new podcast series on healing the mind-body connection. I'll see you next week. Peyton, we'll see you in a month. Later. Bye. Bye.